So we have uh, Susie Kalalis, who is from uh, Career and Professional uh, Development Services, that's going to talk a lot about internships and resources here. So I know many students have questions about um, how to get connected with the experiences that you're interested in. Time, time, Mama. And move on into um, another position. Uh, and then we have uh, Angela Hustler here, who is an alumni uh, from Chess, from ASU, and um, went on to do great things. But she was in right where you, uh, many of you, um, were um, not too long ago. And so we appreciate her sharing her expertise and um, how she landed where she is now. Um, and then we also have uh, Emily Early, who's also an, an ASU alumni. Um, and so appreciative of, of her knowledge and experiences that they will share. And when they speak, I'll let them go into more detail about their background and their majors and where they are now. So I'm going to start it off and turn it over to Susie uh, to get us started for today. Thank you, Karita. Hello, everyone. My name is Susie Kalachi, and as Karita mentioned, I am with the Career and Professional Development Services here at ASU. You might hear us um, referred to as the Career Center or Career Services. Um, any of those names will answer by, and we can definitely help you out with a lot of different things while you're here at ASU, but then also when you're an alum as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and tell you a little bit about us. All right, so um, one of the main uh, reasons that we are here is to help you explore and identify the experiences you need to get to your next step. Um, so no matter where, wherever you're at in your, um, in your process, we're here to help you identify and leverage your natural strengths and translate that um, into a really cool career for you in the future. So some of the things that we can help you with is career advice or career coaching. Uh, so co career exploration, maybe you don't know how your uh, major relates to your career, we can definitely help you with those conversations. Resume and cover letter development and review, job and internship, internship search, informational interviewing. Maybe you want to um, really find out how to make your LinkedIn profile work to your advantage and, and figure out how to build that out to the best of your advantage. We can help you with profile development. Interviewing prep and practice, sometimes called mock interviews, we can help you with those as well. Salary negotiation, personal statement, and graduate school resources. And we also have quite a few online resources available to you as well. We have virtual advising um, every day of the week. We have drop-in hours, and I'll share a little bit about that later. We also have resume Dropbox on our website. If you just really quickly need your resume or cover letter reviewed, we can do that for you. You just go to our website, submit and upload your resume, and we will get the feedback to you within three to five days. Otherwise, you can set up a more personalized appointment with us, and we'd be super happy to help you with that. Um, interview Stream is a really cool tool available to you um, where you can simulate mock interviews and you can really give yourself feedback as well and, and record yourself doing an interview, see how you're doing. Um, you can grade yourself on different things as well. Um, but then also you can request that we at CPDS um, also review it and, we'll and we'll, we will return that feedback to you within a few short days as well after your submission. Webinars in YouTube. We have a YouTube page of different resources that are available to you. If you just need a quick search of, of what, how should I phrase my, uh, my personal statement, we have that available to you. And then the ASU Mentor Network is a really cool resource available to students where you can connect with other Sun Devils um, in your field and see what they like, what they don't like about the industry that you're pursuing. Um, get their feedback of, of you know, what sort of, sort of advice do you wish that you um, could give yourself as a college student and that kind of thing. And that is all available on our website at career.asu.edu. We also participate in career events like job and internship fairs and workshops such as this one, um, as well as employer events. <clears throat> you can find all of that on Handshake, which I will talk a little bit about later. Um, so some ways to engage with us online, checking out our website for um, the comprehensive collection of virtual resources that we have, helpful handouts. Um, that is a super quick way to get yourself um, knowledgeable with different things as far as career. Um, what can I do with this major is a super cool um, tool that we use on our website. You can just type in your major and see what kind of jobs and fields are open to you with that. Um, different handouts, like how do I write a personal statement? Can you give me an example of what a resume should look like? Um, those kinds of things, it's all available on our website, super comprehensive, super cool. Um, we also have drop-in hours and you can also schedule that one-on-one -on -one advising time 
Um, and to do so, you would go into Handshake. Um, so if you do not yet have um, a Handshake profile, we recommend that you do build one out. Um, and this, you can also make it open so employers can see you. Oh, I, I see that you're a junior um, studying this major. We think that you'd be a great fit for our position um, at the museum. So, you know, go ahead and apply, that kind of thing. Um, Handshake is also where you'll check out different events that we have going on, those career fairs, those workshops that we talked about earlier. And then lastly, Handshake is where you can set up an appointment. You can check out our virtual drop-in hours, dropping in anytime uh, during those allotted slots, and then also scheduling those one-on-one -on -one appointments with that career coach who will be able to help you with, um, with a lot of different things. So next I wanna talk through career competencies. Um, so we found that there are eight career competencies that employers are looking for students to have when they're entering the workforce. And the good news is that these are all soft skills and they can be developed in a multitude of ways. Um, so the first skill is critical thinking, right? Understanding how to problem solve, figuring out the best, um, you know, the best solution to the situation based off of the context. Um, the next is communication, and that's pretty straightforward. You know, being a communicator is something that employers are always looking for. Um, leadership, your ability to lead others and to, to be a great role model in the workplace. Technology, um, you will probably not be surprised, but with the pandemic, our needs for technology have heightened um, exponentially. So your ability to use different modes of communication like Zoom, um, email, that kind of thing, that can be super, super helpful when you're looking for a job. Career and self-development, employers are really looking for employee, employees who are just passionate about their continual growth um, and lifelong learning. Teamwork, can you collaborate well with a team? Can you work well on your own, but also with that team? Professionalism, you know, are you showing up to work on time? Um, are you dressed appropriately? Those types of things. And then uh, last but definitely not least, equity and inclusion, um, your ability to treat others um, the same across, you know, to be equitable in your treatment of others, um, to participate in anti-racist um, behavior and, and, um, every, and to that extent. So these are the top eight competencies that we find employers are looking for. And this also relates to the idea of being career ready. So um, career readiness just, you know, really just depends on um, your ability to utilize your collegiate years um, to work on those soft skills, those eight career competencies and, and translate to them to your future career. So a few different ways to become career ready and to really flex those career competency muscles are to get, to get involved in clubs and organizations involved in professional organizations, student activities, community involvement, get a part-time job, course projects, internships, which we'll talk a little bit about later, and then study abroad opportunities as well as service learning. So you might be asking yourself, what kind of job can I get with my major? Um, so here I've just um, opened up a couple of different avenues. So something I wanna point out um, is that your um, your degree gets you in the door, but it is really your skills and who makes you you that really elevates you on your career path. Um, so something to keep in mind is how is my degree related to my interests and can I find a job that incorporates the two? Um, something that we talk a lot about in career is the ability to kind of prevent burnout. Um, and one easy way to do that is to find something you're passionate about doing. Um, so my recommendation for students is always to kind of work out that pros and cons list of like, what, what am I okay with? What am I not okay with? What are, um, what are my, you know, what's my purpose for getting this job? Is it to bring home a paycheck? Is it to just be super excited um, about my, my position every single day? Um, is it to, um, to, you know, grow my lifelong learning and my abilities that way? Um, is it to make a difference in the world? So take your degree, um, match it with what you're interested in, and then you can look at potential career paths as far as that goes. So for example, if you're an applied math uh, major, maybe you have an interest in banking and finance. So maybe you decide you wanna be a financial advisor or maybe actuarial science is something super exciting to you. Maybe your interests lie in research and education, therefore theoretical research or higher education administration, that makes perfect sense to you. And that's a great way to align your degree and your schooling with your interests. Anthropology, what can I do with that kind of major? So if you take anthropology and maybe you're interested in government as well, you can work um, with cultural resource management or maybe as a museum conservationist. Um, there are quite a few um, avenues with, this, um, with these interests. Maybe you have communication interests. So you decide to go into documentary film production or maybe photojournalism is something super exciting to you. 
And uh, global health is, is a super interesting major, super fascinating, especially with the couple of years we've just been through. Um, there's a huge market for global health uh, majors these days. So maybe you have um, a, a great interest in research. So maybe you check out epidemiology or potentially risk management that might be interesting to you. Maybe your interests lie in behavioral and social sciences. So maybe advocacy and legislation is what really gets you going. Or maybe health services administration, that is, you know, that's where you find your fit. So really just keeping in mind what your degree is, what are your interests and how can I make those align in my career path? That's a great way to start um, as you search for your career. So a few different internship search tips and tricks that I have for you um, is to keep in mind some ineffective strategies that you might have heard. Uh, maybe you talk with your parent and they say you need to go out and um, you know, mass produce your resume and send them out to everyone. Um, so we found that could be a potentially ineffective strategy um, just because it's not tailored. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so a couple examples of ineffective strategies are mass applications, no cover letter, and sending out generalized resumes, and also limiting yourself to certain fields <clears throat> and lack of follow-up. So a few effective strategies for you would be to research, research, research. So figure out um, what, you know, what is the mission statement of that company? Um, how can you really tailor your cover letter and resume to that company? Um, reading the full job descriptions, um, that is super huge, especially for those majors where um, you can't necessarily go into, um, into that. So for example, like global health, I can't leave college being, you know, for example, like math, math, applied mathematics, you could leave being a mathematician, right? But global health, right? That is a little bit maybe more ambiguous. So I always recommend to not pigeon yourself, to pigeonhole yourself into um, a traditional career in that, but to read the full job description. Even though this job title might not seem that it relates to me super well, let me open it up, see what the qualifications are, see what the soft skills are looking for are. And yeah, I can see that that does apply to me, but I'm not uh, limiting myself to the job description or to the certain field that I thought I only only had access to with this major. Um, and again, tailoring your cover letter and resume, making sure that it's really tailored to the organization and position that you're looking um, at applying to. So for example, pull words from the job description onto your resume and your cover letter, and that'll really heighten your chances of getting an interview. Um, a lot of employer, employers use some sort of software that runs your resume and cover letter through a database to see if they have any keywords from the job description. So always making sure that you're updating and tailoring your resume and cover letter for each job that you're applying for ensures, um, ensures a heightened level of success in that arena. And then figuring out what kind of competencies match. Okay, they're looking for leadership. Do I have leadership? What are some ways I can develop my leadership skills? What are some ways I can really highlight that I have leadership skills on my resume? And then lastly, asking, is this employer a good fit for me? Um, it has to be mutual beneficial. It has to be mutually beneficial both ways. Um, you're benefiting the company, but also you feel that the company is a good fit for you, your morals, um, your passion, your vision for your life. Um, so asking yourself those questions can really help you to determine if that employer is a good fit for you. So some common search websites, and again, this isn't comprehensive by any means, um, but we recommend starting out on Handshake. In the top left corner of Handshake, there is a tab called Jobs, and you can use that to search for full-time jobs, part-time jobs, uh, internships. Um, if you're an international student, you can use that to, to um, uh, filter if they have the visa requirements that, that you need. Um, but we recommend Handshake for your first, you know, while you're in college, but then also for your first maybe five to 10 years outside of college. Um, to use, uh, look for jobs on Handshake. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a really great opportunity um, for jobs and networking in that area. Um, you can even put a really cool filter on your profile picture on LinkedIn that says you're open to work and then talent recruiters uh, can reach out to you. But also maybe you're following a company that you're super passionate about. Maybe it's the National Park Services um, and they post a position at the park that you're looking uh, into going into, into working for. So absolutely check out LinkedIn for some positions. Indeed, Indeed is a really great um, job search website that can help you find the positions that you're looking for. And then lastly, industry specific websites. Um, so maybe you're looking into going into math, right? Applied math, um, looking into specific math websites or math um, organizations that would have those positions tailored to you and to your interests. 
So a few next steps that I have for you um, would be to save those internship opportunities in Handshake. Um, so going into Handshake, finding those jobs, filtering for internships, and then saving them. And Handshake is pretty smart. So when you start to save and favorite different internships, it'll start um, showing you other opportunities that might be relative to you. Um, so saving those internships opportunities in Handshake. Um, and the next would be to take the Be Internship Ready course, which is um, a self-paced course that we have available to you on our website um, that helps you figure, well, helps you with figuring out how to be internship ready and also how to grow your competencies a little bit more. Um, and then lastly, attending a virtual career and internship advising session. We are super happy to help you with the internship search, with the job search, or if you'd like us to review your, your cover letter and resume, um, maybe after that you get the interview and you want to set up a mock interview, we are super happy to help you with that as well. Um, and again, you can set up those appointments in Handshake. So lastly, your future starts here. Wherever you are in your journey, your future starts here and it can start today. Um, so you can find us at the bottom. We have our, um, our contact information there. So Career services at ASU is our general email account. You can always email us there and we can get you connected to the, to the right person for you. You can give us a call, but then also you'll wanna connect with us and make sure that you have an account on Handshake. Um, and we're super excited to meet with you and to help you with your career needs. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Susie. Um, so while we're transitioning to our next speaker, I wanna take a minute. Do you wanna share in the chat? maybe what your major is, and maybe just some general questions um, that you want from the session. Um, then that way we kind of know who you are out there as, um, as our speakers are, are sharing their expertise. So if you mind, just go ahead and share your major and kind of maybe just some general questions or reasons for the sessions while we are preparing for Emily. I'll turn it over to Emily now. Um, and so you can, while she's getting set up, you're more than welcome then to still um, post in the chat. Hi guys, I'm Dr. Emily Early. I am the curator of anthropology at the Arizona Museum of Natural History. And uh, if you could go ahead and share your majors in the chat, that's really gonna help us tailor some of the advice that we're giving you. Um, so that I have a handle on, on maybe how many of you are actually anthropology majors. So I grew up in the Phoenix area and I went to public elementary and junior high schools and then a private high school. I attended the Barrett Honors College there at ASU and I double majored in history and anthropology. Then I went on to Yale University earning my master's and PhD in biological anthropology focusing on paleoecology of the Chemeron Formation in the Tugan Hills, Kenya. I worked with uh, the late Dr. Andrew Hill there. After that, I was a Peter Buck postdoctoral fellow for two years at the National Museum of Natural History Smithsonian, working for Dr. Rick Potts in the Human Origins Department. My focus was again on paleoecology, but this was actually um, on a few formations in Western Kenya instead of the Rift Valley. From there, I returned to Arizona um, after I, I got married and I taught at a few community colleges, different courses in archeology span as well as biological anthropology. And I was hired as the associate curator at Arizona Museum of Natural History in Mesa. Then a few years ago, I was promoted to curator of anthropology, which is a, a full-time position and I, I head my department. So I curate exhibits, I oversee collections, I conduct anthropology related outreach and I develop programs. I write a lot of grants and do a lot of fundraising and um, a whole bunch of other things just sort of as needed. And it looks like we've got quite a few people in anthropology in some way. So that's great. Karita, do you want me to just move health. through the questions or? <laughs> oh, and I see global health and global health. So do you want me to read some of the questions as, as you share or we can wait till the end? 
Um, what else would you like me? So do you want me to go through the sort of the list that you sent me? Yes. Yep. Go ahead and go through that. And then we'll okay, great. So um, I really enjoyed that ASU's anthropology program had a four field approach. I'm interested in a lot of things. And while I do like some amount of in-depth research, which I can't emphasize enough, you do have to enjoy that if you decide to pursue a graduate degree. <laughs> you have to like kind of get into the weeds of some of it. Um, so I, I do like that, but I enjoy the broader approach of paleoecology and thinking about the big picture while constantly learning specific things about a variety of animals. I also knew pretty early on, um, even as an undergraduate, that my ideal job would be in a museum setting. And as I continued with anthropology, I realized that a natural history museum setting would really be the best fit. And so to that end, I have consistently volunteered in archeological or natural history museums at absolutely every stage of my degree. So starting as an undergraduate, while I was pursuing my master's, while I was getting my PhD, while I was a postdoc, I still volunteer at other museums, actually, even as a working museum professional. Like I said, I'm the curator of Anthro at AZMNH, and so that includes management of full and part-time employees, interns, as well as a lot of volunteers. So that requires a really, a good grasp of communication and, and who needs what kind of communication and what information all of these different people need in order to best do their jobs and support my work and their work. Good communication is also required for leadership. I frequently head up projects that move across departments, so not just within anthropology, um, so things like really large collections moves where then I'm working with paleontology and our exhibits team and special operations over in another city department. And if you can't lead and communicate well and lead laterally too with the other departments, it's just not going to be effective. Those projects aren't gonna be successful. Um, some of the most rewarding and challenging aspects of my job go kind of hand in hand. Um, I love working with our local tribes, which I do a lot for collections issues, as well as exhibits and programming. I really enjoy presenting anthropology to the public, but that can provide challenges too when you're working with the local tribes, because you wanna make sure you're always presenting these things to the public in sensitive and appropriate and meaningful ways. So currently I'm working on the redesign of a Southwest archeology span exhibit. And that requires, again, leading across all of those departments. I'm working with exhibits, I'm working with marketing, I'm working with donor development, um, I'm working with education. Those are a lot of different groups, all who have very different backgrounds and trainings and skill sets than what I have. And so you kind of have to tweak your communication for each of those areas. Um, I engage a lot with community stakeholders, with fundraising, managing the timelines for this. And it's very difficult to manage timelines for employees who are not your own employees. So you have to make sure you're also effectively communicating to the people on your team's managers and, and heads of departments. Make sure that everyone's on the same page, they understand their tasks, they know what the timeline is. Um, really important skill sets for these types of activities for me have been solid time management, frequent and effective communication, a good understanding of everyone on your team's strengths and weaknesses. So if someone is really bad with how they manage their time, 
you're not going to put them in charge of developing the timeline for when the exhibit goes out the door. Um, but maybe they're an amazing creative thinker. And so I'll work with them and make sure they're leading up the team on developing our concepts for interactive themes and how to build them. So it really helps if you know all the people you're working with well and can boost them. That's really an, an effective part of leadership. You don't want to do you don't want to make people feel like they're overwhelmed and they're not succeeding. An effective leader is always helping boost everyone else up. Um, a big part of that for me, and, and this would be helpful if you go on in a graduate career as well, but is, is also very helpful just in the workforce, is the ability to see a large task and not feel so overwhelmed because you know how to break that up into smaller manageable tasks and steps and be able to keep your team focused on those small steps. Um, and I think, I think Susie would probably say too, that's really helpful even when you're applying to jobs. You know, don't, don't have this big panic of, oh my gosh, I'm applying to jobs and I, I have this huge overwhelming task ahead of me to find this job. Break it up into small steps. You can work on your resume. That's one small step. You can identify a company that you would like to work for and start researching it. That's one small step. Everything becomes so much more manageable that way. And it, it really helps for you to not feel overwhelmed. And then you're not communicating that feeling of being stressed and overwhelmed to the rest of your team because that's also not effective leadership if, if everyone's panicking all the time under your direction. Um, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of panic in, in most careers in the last two to three years. And um, museums were certainly hit very hard. Um, we are public spaces when it was the very beginning of the pandemic, that was an initial shutdown and most museums had no idea when we were going to reopen. We frequently don't have very high budgets anyway, and we're typically always looking for funds from somewhere else. That's why I, I write so many grants. Um, so there was a real fear that a lot of jobs would be lost and that we may not ever recover those positions. Um, every institution responded differently. I'm sure none of you are surprised. There are a lot of differences from state to state. Um, we have been open to the public since October 2020, so over a year. Um, but this also meant that there was there were a lot of shakeups in terms of um, our staff, and this is across the board. That's actually nationally, and I assume internationally. So what happened at the very beginning of the pandemic, when there was a shutdown, is a lot of senior leadership were at or over the age of retirement, and a lot of them chose to go ahead and retire when the pandemic hit. They were looking at it as a way to help their organizations financially because they have very large salaries a lot of the time. But I'm sure you can all then imagine that that was very difficult for staff who no longer had their same leadership and had to try to navigate what to do in a very unprecedented situation. So there's there's definitely been a lot of reevaluation across the board of mission statements and the identity of your organization, how you proceed with that. And, and a lot of employees in, in our field and, and everywhere else, I think, really evaluating what their priorities are, where they feel safe and comfortable, if they want to work from home or hybrid or in person. And so there's been quite a few shifts in employment kind of a, across the board with people making those personal decisions as well. Um, if you 
are interested in a career in museums, first off, really think about what kind of career you want in the museum. There, there's a lot of different types of museums, not just related to anthropology. Um, depending on the size of the museum organization, you may be doing something very different. So my job as a curator at azm &H, given that we are a, probably a medium-sized um, museum, I do a lot of things like designing exhibits on a regular basis, supervising the collections moves that I would not do as a curator at, say, the Smithsonian, where my primary job would be research. And if I was lucky, I might design one exhibit in my entire career there. Um, so think about the size of the organization and, and try to get into it. Museums are always looking for volunteers. I mean, always. Every single museum is always looking for a volunteer. Um, I do understand that it can be a luxury sometimes to have, have the time and ability to volunteer to, to provide your services for free. Um, I will warn you that most museums don't offer paid internships. We certainly don't. However, many are very willing to work with you and get you course credit for an internship. That's, um, that's the compromise that I came up with for my department. And we have had students from ASU within anthropology, within history, um, all sorts of different degrees come in and we've been able to provide them course credits. And so we're happy to work with you. I've worked with lots of different counselors in different departments and the hours that you would be required to do this will vary, but we can certainly work out a schedule for you. Um, our exhibits team at azm &H also works with interns to provide course credit. So that's a very different kind of skill set as well. But once you get into the museum setting, you can start figuring out what those titles are and how they might work within a museum and then start talking to all of the other staff about how their job might look different at a different organization. Um, for anything paid at most museums, kind of the just foot in the door positions are going to be front desk staff, um, really temp positions for things like outreach activities. You know, maybe they're looking for someone to work 10 hours a week, bringing, a paleontology kit into local schools or something, um, or you're manning a booth at, at a big SciTech festival or something um, and providing pamphlets and things, facilitating birthday parties. Every once in a while, we'll be able to get temp funds for collections work. Um, the best way to usually find out about those sorts of things is get on the listserv for some of your local museum associations. Um, MAA is very good, and if if Karita doesn't know some of those organizations, I, I'd be happy to send her links as well. She's got plenty of resources like that for you, I'm sure. Um, if you can, volunteer. Like I said, that's a good foot in the door. And do you understand that as a volunteer or an entry-level position, you're probably gonna be doing some tasks you don't enjoy or that are pretty boring and seem very mindless. Um, we do, as part of our internship, we try to make sure that, that students rotate through some different activities so that there are things that are getting accomplished that we need to accomplish and they might be a little more boring. You could be scanning some of our, our archival papers for a few hours. Um, but then we try to work with the students to make sure you're also getting something out of it in terms of not just your career experience and deciding if you like this or not, but something that is engaging and exciting and stimulating for you to learn about. 
whether that would be the community outreach portion or something more complicated with collections. Um, network, absolutely network. Make yourself known to at least one of your professors for a letter of recommendation for any jobs, for any um, higher degrees or programs that you might pursue. That might mean you offer to do something for them in their lab. Maybe they need, you know, honestly, a lot, a lot of my professors still had slides. Hopefully that's taken care of now, but there was a lot of boring stuff like, you know, scanning slides and things for them, but make yourself visible, make yourself known in a way that stands out outside of class so that you'll have stronger recommendations. Um, anthropology in particular is a pretty small field. If you're networking, you'll discover that quite a few people you know are actually connected in some way. And don't just focus on networking with people who are more advanced than you are. Network with your peers because you never know what other job you're gonna end up in where that peer may be in the same place or know someone who is there and be able to help you out. Um, and just as a last piece of advice, I know typically um, you'll hear from advisors if, if you're in a lot of these fields like global health, bioecology, anthropology, keep in mind all of your professors took the same track. They went on and got an advanced degree and are now professors teaching in a university conducting research. So that's going to be the advice that they are most comfortable with and what they know the most about. But there are a lot of other jobs out there. There are a lot of government jobs actually available in anthropology through park service, through all sorts of different organizations. Um, those are advertised a little bit differently. I'm pretty sure Susie can give you some good resources and information about that. Um, you'd be going through websites that are maybe a little more unfamiliar like USA Jobs. So reach out, make sure you talk to some of your resources and find ways to connect with people who have actually done this before because there are little tricks and tips for, for all of these different ways to get your foot in the door. And sometimes you're not even realizing it, you'll go through to apply and you were perfectly qualified for it. You just happen to check the wrong thing in the wrong box. <laughs> and if you would have clicked that yes instead of no, it would have gotten you through to the review process. So you have wonderful resources available to you and use them. Thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, so I know there were some comments and so we'll, we'll save it. So we'll go to our next speaker um, and then we'll have questions at the end. Hi, I'm Angela Huster and I'm currently a principal investigator archeologist for Paleo West here in Phoenix. So Paleo West is a cultural resource management company and for those of you who may not be familiar with this side of archaeology or anthropology, um, CRM companies are private companies that are hired by either private developers or, say, municipal or state or federal agencies to do archaeological and historical preservation work that's required by various different laws. Um, so we actually have a lot of overlap with things like environmental consulting. And before I get into my own background, I'm going to briefly mention that most archaeologists work in sort of one of three types of jobs, which Emily already did a bit of this. So these are sort of academic teaching and research type jobs. Um, so again, you know, the sort that all your professors have and are, you know, might be pushing you toward. Um, the second one is agency archaeology positions. So for a wide variety of different levels of government agencies, um, they either have staff archaeologists or some sort of a shared archaeologist. This is true even for agencies that are not really intuitive. So things like State Fish and Game or the Army Corps of Engineers have archaeologists. Um, archaeologists get hired in weird places. Um, and then the third major career track is private cultural resource management companies. 
Uh, I've done a bit of at least all three of these types of work and you'll see that as I go over my own background. Uh, my coworkers um, here at Paleo West don't just include archeologists. So for those of you who might be more interested in other branches of anthropology or sort of sister fields, um, we have bioarchaeologists and physical anthropologists who do a lot of our burial documentation and NAGPRO related work. Um, we have historians and architectural historians. So um, the company was just doing a project documenting a historic neighbor, African-American neighborhood in Jacksonville um, to get nominated for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, we have an artist who does artifact illustrations. We have an entire GIS division. And then actually our lab and curation specialist has her degree in museum studies. So, uh, you know, we overlap a lot of the different parts of Shask, things that Shask covers. In terms of how I got here, um, I guess I was one of those people who decided when I was a kid that I wanted to be an archeologist and then I actually stuck with it. Uh, so the Forest Service takes volunteers for archeology span and historic preservation projects. Um, there's a program called Passport in Time. And my first couple hands-on projects were actually with them as a teenager, um, where I round up someone to be a responsible adult and go volunteer for a couple of weeks. Um, I also spent a summer as an intern for the Wallowa Whitman National Forest Archaeologist when I was in high school. And that's where my other career thread is that I spent a lot of time in Mexico growing up. Um, I like to joke that my mom was a hippie who was born 10 years too late. So, uh, she homeschooled myself and all my siblings. She was originally from Southern California. And so when she got tired of the fact it rained in Oregon for six months straight, we would find ourselves hitchhiking across Mexico for a month. Uh, anyway, that resulted in a lot of my existing interest um, being focused on Mesoamerica, Mexico, and um, a lot of my archeological studies being focused there. Um, in terms of my academic background, um, like I think I just said, I'm originally from Oregon. So I did two years at the local community college and then two years at the University of Oregon where I earned my bachelor's in anthropology and Spanish. Um, I then came to ASU and earned my MA and PhD there. Um, actually, for those of you who know, I'm working with Dr. Smith. I picked my undergrad school for practical reasons. I needed to stay in state for financial reasons. And of the schools in Oregon, pretty much the only one that had anyone who worked in um, Mesoamerican archeology span was the University of Oregon. Um, when I went to look for graduate schools, I was looking for a school that had multiple professors working in Mesoamerica so that I'd have multiple options for who to work with. And then I want someone who is actively running a field project. You don't have to do that in terms of graduate school, but it does make um, certain aspects of it easier in terms of putting together a dissertation project. Um, Dr. Smith was just starting a project at the Aztec site of Kalish Lawaka when I started at ASU. And so that's where all of my dissertation work ended up being. I actually ended up spending about two years total in Mexico in the field for that project between the survey, the excavation and all of the follow-up lab seats. So partially overlapping with my academic training, I did some initial volunteering for the Bureau of Land Management, um, starting with connections that I'd made actually with the high school internship that um, the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service often have sort of interwoven land management. And so there's often sort of paired sister offices that end up working with each other more closely than you might think um, for agencies that actually report to two different cabinet secretaries. And then that eventually ended up getting hired to work for them for a few summers as an archeological technician um, after I finished my undergrad and then during my first couple of years at grad school. I did another short stint for the Bureau of Land Management here in Arizona um, when I was finishing up writing my dissertation and desperately needed a break and they needed someone to cover um, their archeology span desk for a couple months while their usual archeologist span was out for open heart surgery. It worked out well. Uh, then uh, while I was in grad school, I was also usually one of your teaching assistants. And then I taught a couple of classes independently for Shesk as an instructor of record.
after I finished my PhD, I spent a year as a adjunct instructor, which means that I was someone who was being hired to basically teach by the, I was getting paid by the class um, for Oregon State University. Um, went back and caught up with my family a bit while I was up there. Um, I also started working with two new academic research projects, um, one of which was run by Dr. Moorhart here at ASU, and then the other one is run by Dr. Clayton, who's a Shusk graduate, who's now a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, both of them focused on sort of a different time period in central Mexico, so I got some experience in terms of having to pick up a completely new set of literature and ceramic types and uh, site backgrounds from that. Um, I was the ceramic analyst and the field lab manager for both projects. Uh, after that one year of teaching, I came back to ASU as a postdoc, um, which there's a few different types of postdocs, but what I was doing was a position where I'm hired to work for a particular research project for a set amount of time. They're usually grant funded. So I ended up working for two back-to-back -back projects, spending about two and a half years working on legacy data management and ongoing artifact analyses for the Teotihuacan mapping project. And then about one year working on a project on how long settlements typically last in different parts of the world. So that sort of gets up through the end of last year. Um, we did some creative bookkeeping with the pandemic in terms of figuring out how to stretch out those postdocs um, because things were so up in the air. Uh, and then in March this year, I started my current position at Paleo West. So in general, principal investigators at CRM companies are responsible for making sure the archeology span we're doing meets the legal requirements. So things like, do we have the right permits? Do we have, are we doing the appropriate amount of sampling? You know, did we do the right artifact analyses? Um, did we turn in the final report? And making sure that we're doing scientifically valid archaeology. My particular position is skewed toward the post-excavation end of projects and excavation projects in particular. So I was originally hired to help with their backlog of report writing um, for big excavation projects. And from there, I've sort of spread out to doing um, ceramic analysis. I'm learning the local Holocom ceramics. I'm coordinating a lot of the other artifact analyses. So that's some um, sending things out, particular artifact types out to outside contractors or figuring out you know, the number of hours we can bill um, for some, one of our in-house employees to, to do a particular analysis. Um, I'm managing permits for a lot of our um, or the state permits for a fair number of our survey and excavation projects. And then I do a fair amount of reviewing um, work for small projects. Um, so while I'm switching, you know, I, it, it sort of sounds like I did a big switch there. I went from, you know, pretty much academic work to, you know, very much private sector work, but there's actually more overlap and I switched regions, but there's a bit more overlap than you, you think that, I had done a lot of heavy duty report writing for the Mexican government. Um, the Teotihuacan postdoc I'd worked on involved a lot of legacy report writing where I had to make sense out of, in that case, 50 or 60 year old field notes and turn them into something comprehensive um, in terms of writing. And now I'm doing it for much more uh, recent projects that perhaps were only done you know, two or three years ago. Um, and I've done a lot of running labs or coordinating multiple types of artifact analyses or keeping track of a large analysis staff. And I've worked with a fairly wide range of archeological materials. So that, that overlaps with what I'm doing now. I will also say that I made sure I kept a decent grounding in US-based archeology. span So I'd have some idea how US-based laws concerning archeology span work and then what local cultural cultural histories were, you know, what goes on in Southwestern archaeology or previously what, you know, went on in Pacific Northwest archaeology um, to leave the option open to switch back into U.S.-based archaeology if I wanted to. Uh, many of the soft skills that you've previously mentioned actually do apply here. For example, most of our data recording is actually digital, we use very, very few paper forms. It's all iPad based with, you know, in-house custom databases, that sort of thing. Um, the, 
you know, cultural sensitivity is a really big part of it. As Emily mentioned, we also do quite a bit of work with the tri local tribes um, where you know, being respectful is a very important part of that. I would say probably one of the biggest changes or most challenging things at the current job is juggling how many projects I'm dealing with at once. That previously I had been working with, you know, maybe at most two or three different projects simultaneously. And here I'm probably keeping track of aspects of at least a dozen projects at once. So in a single week, I might send out permit paperwork for one or two upcoming projects. I might review one or two um, sort of literature review projects where say a developer is going to build something and they just ask us to check, um, has this area already been surveyed? And if so, what did they find? Or um, do we need to survey it? And what's the likelihood that we'll find something? Um, I, at the, in the same week, I'll probably send out some artifacts for analysis from a completed project. I might actually get to do some actual ceramic analysis myself. And then bit, I'll do bits of writing ongoing reports for another couple of projects. I've really had to learn how to both delegate to keep track of all the other people I'm working with and how to use tracking apps to keep track of who's doing what for which project. It's been really interesting and rewarding to see just the sheer amount of work that gets done in CRM archeology, span um, which is a big change coming over from the the more academic focused side where um, we tend to be constant or the academic side tends to concentrate on, okay, so we have this limited amount of money and this is all the project we're going to get to do. So we're going to think really carefully about what we're doing um, as opposed to the CRM side, which is, well, we know what our project area is. We didn't get to pick that, but we'll be doing this one and then we'll be doing the one next door and then we'll be doing this one over here and the data just keeps coming. <laughs> Um, sort of more generally, jobs in archaeology tend to rise and fall with the economy in general, um, perhaps particularly so um, in the CRM or the agency portions of the field. So right now, there's a lot of growth in both um, agency archaeology for you know, various federal agencies and in cultural resource management archaeology. Um, so the large land management agencies, um, frankly, tend to be better funded under democratic administrations. And right now they're currently trying to do a ton of either fire prevention or post-fire salvage work here in the Western US because we've had so many big wildfires. And the uh, archeologists actually have to go in and check and survey before they do those type of projects. The CRM industry currently has a ton of work from both federal infrastructure work, and we're seeing that um, you know, with the new infrastructure bills, we're almost certainly going to have you know, a solid stream of work from that for the next five years or so. And private development, there's a lot of housing development going on um, here right now. Um, from a pandemic perspective, um, CRM was actually considered part of the construction industry and therefore an essential industry, which I found baffling. Um, it says something about how we prioritize uh, different industries. Um, but what it meant that we had to work out physical spacing guidelines for field work. And then um, at least my office pushed a lot of our office work to remote work. So actually for the first four months or so that I had this job, I had been in, I had, I think been into the office once. And that's when I picked up my laptop to go work remotely. The entry level positions for both sort of agency and cultural resource management archeology span tend to be either seasonal or hourly archeological technician jobs. And these are the sort of positions that do honestly most of the hands-on survey and excavation field work. Um, you sort of promote yourself out of doing the fun field work over time. Uh, so there are various internship programs with federal and state agencies or um, if you can figure out who the agency archeologist is, you can just ask them if they're willing to take a volunteer. Uh, many of them will, or there are um, sort of friends of organizations like Friends of the Tonto National Forest um, that you can work through or Friends of the Agua Fria National Monument, um, especially here in the Southwest. Um, 
here at Paleo West. We had um, an intern from ASU last summer. Um, this actually is a paid internship and the federal internships, uh, volunteering doesn't tend to be paid, but um, a lot of the, the internships, most of their internships are paid. Um, so yeah, we had one intern last summer and we're willing to consider taking on another one or two at a time in the future. Um, it worked out well, we're, you know, we'd like to, you know, get some so feeder programs in place to hire people longer term. Um, but because of our scheduling requirements, we actually need full, close to full-time availability, which really does make it a little tricky to do during the semester sometimes. Um, we tried working with um, our, actually our former intern this semester, and we are working with him only being available certain days um, to continue as an employee, but it's just been tricky. Um, so if you wanted to do an internship, you can reach out to me, but we'd probably be looking at either you needing, so like maybe you were only taking one online class for um, like an A or a B session and you did the rest of your time interning with us for that session or um, during the summer. Uh, let's see, more generally, it is really useful to start doing some sort of volunteering or internship or seasonal work before you finish your undergrad because that sort of the practical applied hands-on work is something that people are looking for when they're hiring. Uh, if you're looking at a longer term career, particularly in agency or cultural resource management archeology, span you will probably need to get a master's degree or go on to a PhD because you need a graduate degree to hold a lot of the state and federal permits for archeology. span People can end up in supervisory roles, which is technically what I've got, through a whole bunch of different career trajectories. Um, so of my coworkers in sort of similar higher roles, um, there's one who started out with a, as an archeological field tech in cultural resource management and worked his way up pretty much exclusively in cultural resource management. Um, another one sort of jumped back and forth between federal agency and cultural resource management work staying in the same geographic area that he was interested in. And then, um, as I've just told you guys, I did mostly academic work before I jumped over to cultural resource management uh, earlier this year. Uh, if you are looking to uh, apply for either sort of a, an internship or sort of an entry level cultural resource management job. We're generally screening, I mean, the, the soft skills are great and they will definitely help you stay at the company and do well. But some of the things we're sort of initially looking for in an application are, and you don't have to have all of these. Um, we can, we do a lot of in-house training for stuff, but it would be some prior field or lab experience, you know, just the basics. Would you know how to recognize a flake or a pit house if you saw one on the ground? Uh, you know, how much do we need to train you before we send you out in the field? Um, and the second one would be some degree of outdoor experience. Um, so this is one, so we know you're not going to keel over when we send you out to do a survey when it's 90 degrees out here in Arizona. And that uh, maybe you know how to read a topographic map so we don't have to come rescue you in the middle of the national forest. Uh, you know, so just saying that like you like hiking or you have experience backpacking or that sort of things actually, you know, or, you know, you have a first aid certification, if um, you've ever done anything else that required, yeah, a first aid certification or um, OSHA certification, you're, a lot of our field techs work around heavy equipment. Um, again, not required, we'll, we'll train you into things, but, you know, it makes a good selling point. And then the third one is an ability to write clearly and concisely, because we have to communicate what we find. Um, and that one really helps people move up within the company if they can communicate their findings really clearly. So that pretty much wraps up what I had. I'm going to put a um, couple of links in the chat and Kareed is welcome to save these. Well, thank you. Uh, wow, wonderful information. 
from all three of our panelists. And there are some questions in the chat. So I'm gonna start with the questions from the chat. And then um, after we do that, we, have, we do have some time. Um, people are welcome to unmute and ask them directly. So I'll start with the questions in the chat here. So uh, the ones that share primarily anthropology, we have uh, bioecology uh, and conservation with a minor anthropology, and we also have uh, global health. So some, and then so there's some things that people wanted to know. Um, one question was about how to combine their major and minor together. So the student has a passion for biology and ecology and conservation, but also for anthropology. So how would they best utilize all of that in a career and a job or entry level job? And, and I'll, I'll leave that to any, any of the panelists. Uh, Paleo West is a cultural resource management only company, so we only do sort of the archaeology and historical side, but it's actually fairly common for cultural resource management to be nested within larger environmental consulting companies where you will also be doing things like environmental clearance, and this would be a case where they'd see having a field tech who could do both would as a plus. Any other panels want to comment? So are you looking for a career that would result directly from your bachelor's degree? Because if that's the case, that will be different than um, if you were to apply, if you were to go the academic path and uh, apply to one of those um, higher degree programs, I can tell you right now, having that many other majors and minors that could potentially tie together, would make you a very attractive graduate student because you've got a lot of other disciplines and um, background knowledge of, of kind of um, those areas of study and the methodology that then might, might put you in a unique position to come up with a project that was cross-disciplinary in ways that someone who had simply majored in anthropology or simply majored in bioecology wouldn't. So move on to the next one. Uh, Susie, did you want to share anything? Yeah, I can add in a little bit here. Um, I personally think that they um, overlap quite a bit. Like for example, um, like natural resource manager, park naturalist, environmental consultant, those types of things that might be of interest to you. Um, I did drop a link in the chat. Um, what can I do with this major? And this is a resource that we use AS at ASU, but it's not um, an ASU created resource. So um, the majors and minors might not relate directly to some of the niche um, offerings of ASU. But if you click on that link, you can see some of the different um, areas of anthropology. Um, and you can kind of go through and see what might be of interest to you. And then from there, you can kind of craft that, um, or you can make that the basis of your internship search or job search. Um, and that might be of interest. Um, one of the reason why internships are so important is that it gives you a really low pressure introduction onto what it's like to be um, an employee in that career field. So maybe you get a really cool internship that aligns both your major and your minor and you decide, no, this is not the career path for me, right? Like that's, um, it, it's not time wasted. It was still a valuable time um, where you've learned a lot of different things and you've also learned what you did want and what you don't want out of your career. Um, so that's why having a variety of internships is also super helpful for you. Um, and it might help you to find that alignment between your major and your minor. Thank you. Uh, so another uh, comment is that someone's interested both in research and they want to do something with advocacy work. I mean, talk, I'll be going to talk a little bit about that in your journey. Um, do you have any other comments about that? You, you may want to look at some of the uh, local tribal websites for cultural resources management within the tribal communities, because um, not only would that provide potentially some research opportunities working as an archaeologist, but 
frequently those cultural resource departments within the tribe often do a lot of outreach and advocacy work, particularly about preservation and conservation. Any other comments? Um, public health might be um, interesting to you as well, like um, educating um, different communities on preventative health or, um, you know, different things like that. But global health and advocacy and research, I think they align quite well. Um, and there are a lot of really cool fields that might be of interest to you. Um, but really finding out kind of where your interests lie. So for example, um, my undergrad was in communication, but my interests lied in um, anti-trafficking. And so for a few years, I found myself in a career path um, that aligned the two of them. And now um, I am working in higher ed with career development and that aligns my interests as well. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can um, integrate both your interests as well as your major. And if you think back to my slide, um, you know, it has our major and then our interests, and then that kind of results in a really cool career path for you that would be super interesting. But global health, um, you know, there are a lot of open doors available to you. Um, so I think the sooner that you can kind of nail down, like, okay, what are my interests? What what makes sense to me for my career path? Um, you'll be set up for success um, in the future as you decide on those opportunities. So another, thank you. Another question is, um, anthropology is so broad as a field. So how do you figure out what you want to do for a career? Is this something you have to figure out before you graduate? Uh, Any of you? I mean, I, I would say that if, if you're not interested in continuing directly in anthropology, so going on with a higher degree, which which you do need for a lot of the jobs in museums, academia, you know, the cultural resource management, then you should, yeah, you should probably figure it out before you graduate. Um, if, if you're not sure if you want to obtain a higher degree, you don't have to do that immediately following graduation. Um, there are entry-level jobs in a lot of these sorts of organizations um, that you could take just to support yourself and kind of figure out, is this a good fit? Is there something I want to research? Is there a solid career path? And then, then from there, decide exactly how far you want to take it or, or that you want to leave the field and, and Either way is fine, whatever's, whatever's the best fit for you. Yeah, I guess there's, I, I, I see sort of picking a path as having two different aspects. One is sort of the traditional subfields within anthropology and which one are you more interested in? Are you more interested in the cultural side and the archeology span side? And you can do some of the narrowing down there by taking different internships with different ASU professors. Many of them offer the RAP internships in their labs and you know, get a taste of this is the type of research a physical anthropologist might do, or this is the type of research a cultural anthropologist might do. Uh, so that one can be sort of figured out within the university and is actually to some extent harder to figure out after you leave because you may not have that breadth of opportunities available. Uh, the other side of it is sort of what type of work um, context do you want? Do you want to do government archaeology? Do you want to do academic archaeology or government anthropology of any sort, um, academic anthropology of any sort. And that, as uh, perhaps my own career trajectory points out, is you do have more options in terms of flipping back and forth um, in terms of, of what um, aspect of the subfield you're working with. I agree with both. I oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I agree with both Emily and Angela. Um, and something that I always point out is that career is not linear. Um, you know, it's not always major to career and it's a straight path, a straight shot. Sometimes it is, and that's great. Um, but a lot of times it's not. Um, and I think 
also sometimes we have this misconception in college that right when we graduate, we're going to have our dream job available to us right away. And that's not always the case, unfortunately. Um, so building those stepping stones while you are here at ASU is super, super important. Developing those competencies, taking those internships, um, especially if there's maybe two paths that you're looking into going into, um, as Angela stated, like maybe getting an internship in this path, getting an internship in that path, and then deciding which is a great fit for you. Um, and also, as Emily pointed out, you might decide later in life to make a career transition. That is totally okay. That is not a sign of failure in any way. Um, and that also like gives you, um, that gives you, I think a competitive edge is if you have, um, a diverse experience and a diverse career and resume. Um, but I would say that you do not need to know, you do not need to have it figured out what you want to do for the rest of your life before you graduate. Absolutely not. That is something that can change and evolve with, um, different stages of your life and different experiences that you've had. Um, you know, this idea of lifelong learning that ASU promotes is, is really so, um, so important because you might not find yourself in the same career for the rest of your, um, of your life, you know, and that's totally okay. And that can be a good thing. Um, so just embracing, um, you know, just being able to embrace change and being able to adapt uh, is super, super important in your career because it is not going to be linear. Uh, I want to, before I, I kind of follow up with that, I want to make sure if other people have questions, you're welcome to unmute or if there are other follow up questions in the chat that you want to put in the chat. So I have a couple follow-up questions um, for all of you. Um, really going back to like, think back to when you were, you know, a freshman or sophomore and you're just starting out and you kind of shared like you were um, fascinated by uh, anthropology. I guess, what was it that I guess really sparked your interest and, and kind of follow up that? What helped you decide like, this is the route I want to go? What was, what, I don't know if you remember like, what was that moment for you? Like it's like the over moment, right? Um, well, I when I was 18, right right before I started college, um, I was fortunate enough my family took a, a big trip to Europe. And it was the first time any of us had, had been there. And one of the first places we went was the Natural History Museum London. And I remember walking in thinking, like, oh, my gosh, this is exactly where I want to be all the time. And then as I started taking courses, I, I was originally a history major, which I kept. Um, but then I was a, a student. Uh, I had a student position in Hayden Library, actually, in the preservation department. So working on book preservation, which then you know, started sparking my love of, of objects and caring for those things. And one of the women that I worked with was really into anthropology. She um, benefited by working at ASU by taking some classes occasionally. And so she would talk about the courses she was taking and she encouraged me to, to go ahead and take one. And I realized yeah, this is exactly what I'm interested in. So I'll, I'll go ahead. I have the time. I'll add this as a major. And then it suddenly dawned on me, probably my junior year, I realized, oh, wait, I can actually have a job in this. It was that connection back to, you know, visiting the Natural History Museum and realizing people do actually work at those museums. <laughs> And this is the kind of degree you get in order to do that and to make sure that, you know, it really and truly was what I wanted to do, because if, if you then go in for your graduate degree, you're looking at a long haul. It took me um, six and a half years to get my PhD, which is actually pretty short. At the time, I was an undergrad at ASU. It was taking students 11 years sometimes to get their PhD. Um, so I knew it was a major commitment. So I wrote for a bunch of different small grants, was able to get them. And that meant I could fund being on a, a field school trip to see if this really made sense to me, if I wanted to be 
camping with complete strangers and living with them for weeks on end. And, and it turns out I did. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yeah, in my case, I think it, it really was sort of the combination of the, the volunteer digs as a, a teenager and then spending so much time in Latin America and being able to put the, the two of those together. Um, I was, and still am, fairly shy. And so I joked that I went into archaeology because I thought that if everyone I was researching had been dead for a thousand years, I wouldn't have to talk to living people. This clearly does not work this way. <laughs> that, was, that was an error on Teenage Me's part. <laughs> I have, there's uh, two, two follow-up questions, but that's great. I don't know, Susie, do you want to add anything? I don't have any field experience in anthropology, but I will say that I wanted to be Indiana Jones growing up. So I am just so in awe of both of you <laughs> and super excited for those of you going into anthropology. Um, but no, they sound, no, I don't have much to add except for that. <laughs> A couple of follow-up questions. Um, so the students who studying, uh, is studying anthropology too and love the idea of working with interface nonprofits um, and finding, how would uh, the student find an internship? So Chris, yes. Um, so the, the nonprofit sector is, is pretty large. Um, I'd, I'd start looking at some of the, the national organizations for nonprofits, they may have different internships posted places. Um, you might look at the Piper Trust website. They're a, a really large nonprofit that's local. Um, they fund all sorts of different projects that might might give you a, a launching point for that. Um, I can't say I know that much about interfaith nonprofits specifically. It's more just kind of my experience with with working with nonprofits that help support museums and things. Anyone else anything to add? Um, I can you know, provide some guidance on searching for internships in general. Um, so some of that might be super interesting would just be like, do a quick Google search, right? Like what are, what are some interfaith nonprofits that hire anthropology students um, and then start following them, like following them on LinkedIn, on Facebook, um, getting to know more about their culture um, and the kind of jobs available. And then um, also, you know, just keeping an eye on them, right? What kind of internships do they have available? Do they have internships? Is this something I might have to reach out and, and kind of ask if we can develop an internship um, or can I apply for one that's already um, that's already standing um, but also career and professional development services can help you with that Chris if you want to drop in to our virtual drop-in hours or set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment we can certainly help you with that um, but we always recommend is to do your own research and make sure that this is a company that you feel aligned with um, and that you um, you know you're working on the skills that um, that's applicable to their job description but I think that there would be a, um, some really cool internships that would Align your interest in interfaith nonprofits as well as your anthropology degree. I know I, I saw something on TV where they were looking at doing some different work in Jerusalem um, and some of the different, um, you know, historic information and artifacts there um, and volunteers. So I know I periodically will see different fascinating things. And I'm like, I think about my students. So I would want to be out there doing that. So um, I know there's a lot of terrific opportunities um, if that's an interest. Uh, another follow-up question. Uh, this person wants to know, we probably have time for probably this may be the last one. And then I want to give um, all of our panelists kind of some closing remarks if you want to do that. Um, they wanted this uh, question is, how uh, do you balance work and family life as a field researcher? Great question. It is super, super tricky. Uh, and, and everyone kind of handles it in a different 
way. Um, so I've, I've known some people who um, bring their kids out with them to the field. Um, I think that can work in some settings. You have to be a little bit careful that you're not then putting childcare burdens on like your graduate students or undergrads, which I, I've seen happen. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's just the way it goes. And so, you know, and I, I'm sorry, and I, I don't want to offend any, any men who may be on here, but for women, it usually is a lot harder for having the kids. No one bats an eye when like a male professor goes off to South Africa for three months and his family is at home. But kind of as soon as a, a woman does the same thing, the first question everyone is asking you is, what are you doing with your kids? Where's your kids? Um, that's, that's what your husband is for or partner or whoever it is. So that there are ways to balance that. Um, sometimes there's just, it's a reduction in the field work during, you know, certain seasons of your life. Um, I know other people who have, who have very actively made choices to pursue research locally um, so that it would be an easier option for them to just be having days in the field instead. Um, Angela, what's your experience been with us? Yes. Yeah, so I don't have kids of my own, um, but from, yeah, friends and colleagues, there's, it's always a balancing act. It is, yeah, a, a doable one and one that I think um, actually perhaps um, CRM and some agency work is actually easier to balance than in academia. Um, you're more likely, your, your field sites are generally going to be local um, or things that are, you know, within a day or two's drive and you get, you know, more control over your scheduling. You're not trying to get all your field work in, in uh, you know, a single two month go for the, for the year. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I also know particularly academic researchers who have brought their kids into the field for um, a couple months at a time. Yeah, it is a balancing act. Um, it's also one where I would say a disproportionate number of female anthropologists end up married to other anthropologists. Um, and then you end up with trying to balance both careers for better or worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, personally, I, I'm not married to an anthropologist, which, which is kind of rare. I know people outside of anthropology. Um, and um, I, I do have kids. Um, so, you know, I, I've cut down a lot of my field work, but again, that, that depends on your career tra trajectory too, kind of no matter what you're going to do. And I, I, I really hate to break this to all of you. It's going to be a struggle in whatever career you're in to do the, the balance of work and family life. Um, you know, my, my current position is full-time salaried that usually doesn't mean 40 hours a week. It usually means more than that. If you're really active in your career, you're probably doing other things too. Like I said, on a nonprofit board, um, I just got the Piper Fellowship. So it's, it's a lot. You just kind of have to figure out how to manage your time. Sorry, there's not an easy answer. So it's not typically eight to five. It's all kinds of range of outcomes. A lot of this can be kind of sussed out a bit in the interview process if you do ask them what kind of flexibilities do you provide uh, to employees doing field work research. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you can kind of figure that out, like get a sense for um, are they are they, you know, very strict on those hours or do they provide more flexibility? Do they allow you to bring your kids with you to the field um, experience? And then maybe once you do um, get the position, maybe you could ask some of your colleagues, how do you um, balance your 
your work and family life here as well. Um, and also, you know, asking them how they prevent burnout can be super helpful for you as you're just entering in a new position. So I wanna, um, within archaeology, there um, people with child care responsibilities do sometimes skew more toward the lab and project management side of things that can be done on a more nine to five or eight to five schedule and with less travel involved. So they, they trade the sort of frontline field work for the post field work or support roles for at least the years when they have small children. So we're nearing the end of our time. I want to be respectful. Maybe each of the panelists want to share maybe a quick 15 second, I guess, summary or update or jobs or whatever uh, that you want to share kind of to wrap us up. Well, I'll start with Susan. Sure. Um, well, I just want to say thank you all so much and thank you for, um, you know, engaging with us as well, letting us know your majors and what kind of questions we can help you with. Um, I would say a really great next step for you would be to make an appointment with a career advisor so we can talk through, we can have some of these conversations with you. Um, and hopefully you can feel a lot better about the trajectory of your, um, of your career and how you can best leverage your, um, your years here at ASU. So please come and see us. And I'll go say Dr. Early or go to Dr. Early. Yeah, just, um, you know, join those listservs, take advantage of these resources that you have here, and um, volunteer or intern if you can, or, or try to take an entry-level position somewhere. Getting, actually getting in there gives you a much better sense of the culture of a place and the types of activities you would be doing in a job. Even if you're not doing it necessarily, you get to see what the other people are doing and that's super helpful. Yeah, I guess I'd just say, you know, reach out and ask whether a company or an organization you're interested in working with is looking for, would consider taking an intern or is hiring because positions don't always necessarily get posted. And that's something I really did not realize. You know, if, if I had to tell my undergraduate self one thing, it would be to reach out and ask. They're not going to think you're presumptuous. You know, at worst, they'll tell you, no, we don't have anything right now, or if we don't do that. So just to, uh, I guess, kind of final wrap up, there are resources um, that each of the panelists posted in the chat. So I do recommend you save those. We will include some of this in our student newsletter. So we'll send some of that out as well. And then what you're really fortunate here in Chess is that we have a lot of uh, different opportunities set up for you. So um, our panelists agreed to uh, present today because they do uh, host student interns. And so we'll help connect you with them or other different intern sites um, by meeting with our team here. We have our research apprenticeship program where you can connect with faculty there. And there's other volunteer experiences in our department but throughout the issue and so we can connect you with that um, as well so there's no reason even as a freshman that you can't start volunteering mm -hmm. and exploring potential options so that when you do get ready to graduate you know whether you want to go on to graduate studies or step into an entry-level job and you're well prepared so thank you thank you thank you to our panelists for taking time out um, to share your expertise, share your personal experiences. It's invaluable. We will also save this um, recording on the website so students can go back and review that again. So I'm going to stop recording. Uh,